Thanks a lot. So, hi everybody. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. I, I like it a lot. Had never been to the state. And, well, in particular, this is supposed to be part of Arkansas. So, indeed, beautiful state. So, um, yeah. So, first of all, this is joint work with Emmy Murphy, and uh, the preprint will come out very soon. It's essentially latex and everything, but uh, yeah, we just haven't done it yet. Um, it says contact topology from the Legendrum viewpoint, but it should say contact and symplectic topology from the Legendrum viewpoint. So the first talk is going to be essentially contact. So I'm, I'm going to try to restrict myself really to contact structures, open books, and Legendrins. And then the second talk, which is going to be after a 20 minutes break, it's going to go into the world of symplectic topology where life sheds and by life sheds vibrations will appear. Anyhow, um, the tool that we use and that we have constructed and I want to present, it's called the Front Dictionary, just a name. And I, I want to tell you what this is about, if this works, if this doesn't work. Great. So, okay, the goal for these two talks is to develop something which we call the Legendrian Front Calculus. So if you do know Kirby Calculus, you'll realize that having diagrammatic interpretations of manifolds is extremely useful. For instance, you're able to say the two manifolds are smoothly diffeomorphic, if you don't leave, you know, you can do some moves in the Kirby diagrams. Same things happen with Legendrian fronts. You have some moves, the Rademeister moves, and then you might be able to say that two manifolds obtained by surgery or by handle attachment are the same just because the knots are Legendrian isotopic, something that you do realize by doing some Rademeister moves. So this is very well developed in dimension three, quite well understood completely not understood in higher dimension, and the goal is to fill this gap. So um, the applications are quite diverse. I have written some of them. Um, here's the first one. Uh, so sorry, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to, in particular, draw a dent twist in the Legendrian fronts. I'm going to explain what a dent twist is. And we're also going to perform Rademeister moves. I'm going to say something about it, what higher dimensions Rademeister moves look like. And also I'm going to explain what handle slice look like in, in this, in this Legendrian world. And uh, the upshot picture is this. You do stuff and you end up with this picture. And then you become very good at manipulating these pictures with a set of rules that I'll give you. So uh, the nice thing is, or a horrible thing, is that you don't need to understand anything in order to do it. So you can black box all the moves, just use them, and that's a machinery that, you know, tells you things computes you invariants, such as wrap Fukai categories. I'm going to go there at some point. OK, so uh, sample of applications of the front dictionary. Well, if you're given two Stein manifolds, think of it as Weinstein, I will describe what they are. But essentially, there's something described by a Legendrian link. Then you can say they're the same if by doing some moves in the front, they become Legendrian isotopic, those links. So something maybe more interesting, that it's not a priori obvious, is how to use these things in order to detect overtwistedness of contact manifolds. So John has already introduced what overtwisted means in dimension three. We have kind of glimpses over it in higher dimensions in Chris and John's second talk, but I, I, will, I will explain what it means in higher dimensions to be overtwisted, and then how to detect some overtwistedness in some examples. So a third application is that if you do have a front, you can do something which we will call pinching, which essentially are anti-surgeries, and these operations are going to allow you to say that these manifolds actually contain exact Lagrangians. And then maybe you want to find something like exact Lagrangian tori, Klein bottle, so on and so forth. But having a diagram allows you to do those things combinatorially. So part four, and that's more delicate, maybe that's for the experts, but to detect flexibility and subflexibility of Weinstein manifolds. So flexibility and subflexibility are defined in terms of what happens to a Legendrian link. So something is flexible if there exists a handle body decomposition which has a Legendrian link with a certain property. So if you're able to get a front and then you do things to the front and you get that property, then the thing is flexible. So first time in life I announced this publicly, I'm going to prove that the chorus Russell cubic is flexible, which we've been <laughs> horribly trying to prove for the last like three months. But uh, yeah, now I'm completely convinced and I'll give a proof. So that's a nice application that I think it, it's interesting. I'll explain why I'm excited about this. OK, uh, five computation of Rob Foucault categories. So this is going through the work of Borman, uh, sorry, uh, Bourgeois, Liashberg, and Eccle, which explains how to obtain symplectic invariants of open manifolds with convex ends, if you wish, Weinstein manifolds, in terms of Legendrian links. 
So essentially, the counting of pseudomorphic cylinders between rep cords can be interpreted in terms of counting pseudomorphic strips between Legendre cords. And essentially, what I'm saying is that you can obtain SH and even the Rafukaya category in terms of LCH or the LCC, the DGA associated to the link. So in particular, if you're able to draw the manifold, you can compute the LCC and then get the invariance out of it. So I'm going to give some examples where this can be done. And then the last example, hopefully I'll get there. These things about Rafukaya categories and so on is going to be part of the second talk. So uh, we bumped into this thing that you can actually prove some instances of mirror symmetry, the affine part of mirror symmetry, by using these drawings. And, and well, hopefully this will be the last example in the, in the next talk. So yes, uh, I will now state a theorem that illustrates some of these points. And then uh, we'll move on to just start from the very beginning, defining everything. But I just wanted to at least say a theorem and say, well, it's worth listening to this guy for two hours. OK, so uh, just for the experts, I really hope to find something that algebraic geometers don't know. So I really would like to find something that algebraic geometers don't know that two things are bialomorphic, but we can actually prove they're not even symplectomorphic. This would be a really nice application. We have applications to algebraic geometry, but something like that would be fantastic. So Coras Russell turns out not to be exotic from our viewpoint. OK, so uh, here's a theorem, kind of theorem you can prove. You're given some affine manifold. Typically in algebraic geometry, we'll give you something like that. And then you are able to completely describe how this manifold is obtained from a topological viewpoint. You start with a ball. You will attach a bunch of handles to it. So technically, it's a Weinstein ball, and you attach Legendre handles. And then if I tell you exactly what the attaching sphere is, in this case, the attaching knot, it's, it's not a link, then you completely understand this manifold, and you can, can compute all the invariants. So in here, I've just described what it looks like. It's detaching along some spun of a A minus B Legendre torus. But the point is that once you know these things, you can start saying which properties do these manifolds have. And I chose these ones because these were the first examples of algebraic manifolds which were flexible. So at some point, there was a complete darkness. And at some point, somebody said that flexible manifolds were not algebraic. And that kind of psychologically spread around. And then everybody believed it. Yeah, it's false. I mean, uh, those, those are examples. And it's, be, it's been known for a while. So first thing, you can detect flexibility sometimes, and even for simple manifolds. Uh, in the second part of the talk, I'll explain why this is interesting, even from a singularity viewpoint. The second thing is that this family, when you put a equals 2, so the polynomial looks like x squared, y2 to b, and then z squared equals 1, then this contains exact Lagrangian bottles. And you know, that's, it's kind of funny. If you look at the equation, I don't see any exact Lagrangian bottles. If you look at the front, it's completely obvious they exist. And finally, when we were presented with these manifolds, which Paul, was the, Paul Seidel was the one suggesting to look at these things, it was known what was symplectic homology. They didn't know what symplectic homology was, and they didn't know whether this was flexible or not. So in particular, we can compute the Rafukaya category of these guys, and they are not flexible. So that means they have symplectic topology in it if A is greater or equal than 2. So for A2, that follows from the fact that they have exact Lagrangians. For higher A's, there are a priori no no exact Lagrangians, but uh, still the Rafukaya category is not zero. OK, so now we're going to go back to kind of the very basics and start with the things that John taught us. So consider a contact manifold, which we're going to write as something being 2n plus 1 dimensional. And on the one hand, John said, well, you can find a submanifold inside of it, which let me write for a second being the boundary of something such that this guy is contact, and then a map pi that goes from y in the complement of this guy into S1. So what you're thinking is that you have your odd dimensional contact manifold. You take out a co-dimension 2 contact manifold, and then the complement becomes a mapping torus, OK, on something which has boundary. So that's one of the approaches that John has explained. And the other one is that this guy is actually the boundary of a co-dimension once a manifold with boundary. And that's what we call W. So that's 2n. And the information of a mapping torus is completely contained in the monodromy. So might as well, instead of pi, just think about what's the diffeomorphism that you get by going by parallel transport once you lift the non-zero vector field on the basis 1. So 
the point of this correspondence is that if you have a contact manifold, you can always write it as some manifold here, which is symplectic. It's actually Weinstein. So for those of you who are not familiar with Weinstein manifolds, first of all, just think of a fine varieties. That's, those are okay. But if you want to think technically, they are exact manifolds, so symplectic manifolds, which have boundary and they have some real form. And then there is a plurisupermonic function phi, which is compatible with the vector field. So it's compatible with lambda. This essentially means that whenever you take a level set of this phi, the vector field is transverse to it, which makes the level sets, the regular ones, least contact. So great. So any contact manifold into dimension, in dimension 2n plus 1 is now a Weinstein manifold in dimension 2n. And this guy is a simple ectomorphism, which is compactly supported and is the identity in the boundary. So it's a simple ectomorphism of those guys. And you have this thing. OK? Now, these guys are not understood at all. Essentially, the only examples we have of simple ectomorphisms, which are identities on the boundary, are either dent twists or fiber dent twists. And that's it. And most of the time, fiber dent twists end up being products of dent twists. So yeah, essentially dent twists. So let's just make sure we understand what a dent twist is. So a dent twist is a simple ectomorphism of T star Sn, which is the identity on, if you want, the unit cotangent bundle. And it's obtained by taking the flat metric, well, I mean, the round metric, the standard metric, and then taking the geodesic flow at time pi. That's going to flow every point to its antipodal point. And that's in, in the base. And then you compose this thing with the differential of the antipodal map. And then if you think a bit about this thing, this is a simple ectomorphism, essentially because it's a geodesic flow, which it is, and then the list of a canonical diffeomorphism. And, and it's the identity in the boundary, because you've flown pi and then you've lifted. it. So this is a diffeomorphism, which typically it's called tau sub Sn. And they will feature a lot around here. So. Uh, it'd be really interesting to understand things which are not dead twists. We can, I'm not sure we can prove, that's a really good question. Can we prove topologically that there are things which are not dead twists or fiber dead twists? Pretty sure they exist, but uh, there's no proof that they exist. So anyhow, let's let us stick to dead twist in, in, this ma in this manifold. Now, something else that you can do is that you could take T star as n and now plumb it to itself, just the different copy, not to itself. That means take T star as n and now identify one fiber with the zero section of the other T star as n. And then you can compose then twist between them. Say so you could do things like this. So that's the first component. So that will be L and that would be S. So you could, you could consider something like that. So a word in then twist. Essentially, all this is saying is that whenever you have a contact manifold, you can reduce it to the study of Weinstein manifolds and simple ectomorphisms of them. And then, because we don't know better, let's restrict to studying then twists. And then this is kind of a combinatorial problem. You can think of it as, as like words with satisfied some kind of braid relation. So here's a picture. This is a fair W. It's a, it's a possible W. And I've drawn two exact Lagrangians in, inside of it. So exact Lagrangians are just Lagrangians of manifolds such that the Liouville form now also restricts in an exact way. That means the lambda is DF. And those are important because those correspond to Legendrians in the contactization. So here's the picture of W. L is the blue one. Then S is this guy, which is in orange. So it goes inside, does something, and then goes around. And now you can take the dent twists of one along the other. And the upshot of that is that given two Lagrangians, you get some other Lagrangians. And if these Lagrangians were exact, you get an exact Lagrangian as well. So this dent twisting one guy along the other produces new exact Lagrangian manifolds in it. So great. Now, Suppose that we are able to draw L in the Legendre in front, and we're able to draw S in the Legendre in front. Question, can we draw tau S of L or its inverse? OK? So I'm going to explain this now. Uh, here's some simple page that we can have. We have T star Sn which, as, as we had before, plumb with itself. Let's call this also a sphere. So that's, that's an S and that's an L. So that's going to be our W, that just this plumbing. And then what you can do is you can take the contactization of W. So you can take W times R, 
and just take, if you want, the, 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 the real form in here and add dt, where t is the coordinate in this interval. And then you want to lift the exact Lagrangians in here to Legendrians in the contactization. So they lift to Legendrians. So the first thing you need to understand is how to draw this global manifold in here. So suppose for a second that W is a plumbing, as it is in this case. Then what you do is you just draw the manifold with identity monodromy. So you draw this manifold. W identity, and I claim that this manifold is exactly the boundary of W times C. Okay, maybe think of it for a second. It shouldn't be hard. That, that this is a Weinstein manifold, and this is a contact manifold, and the Weinstein structure here is the product, and we get exactly this contact manifold. Recall that this one contact-wise means that the contact planes are tangent to the pages, almost tangent to the pages, and then the binding is transverse. So uh, how do you draw that guy? Well, in this case, W is a plumbing of two things. So this is a subcritical manifold obtained by attaching two subcritical handles, which are one index to being critical. So might as well just do something like that. Here's one guy, and here's another guy. I mean, it doesn't matter, just two things. The point is, by H principle, you can just say, hey, here's one handle, here's another handle, and that's it. But that doesn't, doesn't quite work for us, because of course, you can do whatever you want, but this, this doesn't keep track of any information that we actually need. So the key point here is that when you do this plumbing in here, so that's S and that's L, we have two exact Lagrangians, L and S, which do intersect in one point. Now, think of the page as being the Lagrangian projection. Then intersecting in one point in the page means that in the contactization, there should be a rep chord. So what you do is you draw S in here, and then you draw L up in here, and you don't care what's happening anywhere else, but you just keep track of the fact that there's one rep core between them, okay? So that's the way you draw this manifold in here. And now you're gonna have to draw your S, so say that would be S, and then you can draw L. Somebody can complain and say, well, you could draw you know, some rather Meister move here or just do some kind of movement, but it doesn't matter because they're loose. So you can draw whatever you want and you can always reduce to that. And now the question is, we have these two guys, but we also have this guy in here, which is probably this guy or the other guy. It's actually the other guy. Um, and then what's the thing we get here, okay? Is this understandable? We're trying to draw The, the, this rep chord is, is the lift of this. So this, this is the contactization. That's the front of the contactization. And this is the Lagrangian projection. So that's the page. Which, yeah. Because, yeah, it's, it's as in the local picture, this is, you just make it global because you, you only keep track of the intersections. Okay, so now, as we were saying, because essentially we only understand then to is we want to at least be able to draw them. And if we're able to draw S and then L, as in the Kirby diagram, then can we draw tau S and tau L? So the answer is yes. A bit disappointing. Yeah. Uh, it means, Yeah. It's the front in the standard space. So you, you, you take the front locally and then just do sur surgeries in there. So ju just take, think of it as being, I mean, if instead of, if there's no topology, you agree that this makes sense. There's the front. This manifold in here, the manifold obtained by having two handles, is this manifold. Yeah, the, the boundary, this, this manifold here. 
Okay, so th this is a manifold. So th that will use this plumbing in here, and it, it's obtained by attaching two subcritical handles. I mean, it is the, the manifold W itself is obtained by attaching two critical handles. And now, when you multiply by C, they become two subcritical handles. So this is take the ball and attach two subcritical handles. And a, a priori, you wouldn't say anything because H principle just put them whatever you want. But because you want to keep track of this intersection point, you keep track of this intersection point in this rep chord. I'm assuming rotational symmetry. Yeah, these, these are sp spherical invariant like that, symmetrical invariant like that. So th this is dimension 2n, right? Which means that these are subcritical handles, so these are h n minus ones. These are h n's. Yeah. Yeah. You agree with this equality? No, no, you're trying to draw the contact manifold Y. Yeah. And now the contact manifold Y, imagine it has a monotony which is a bunch of dent twists. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. And now imagine plus that this manifold Y, the page, is just a plumbing of a bunch of these. Yeah. Essentially, it's restricting its homotopy type. Then this page is going to be obtained by attaching a bunch of so, well, critical handles for the Weinstein dimension of the page, which are going to become subcritical with difference one index when you multiply by C. I mean, well, let's, take, let's take the sphere. Let's, let's take a very simple page, like T star is one. And now, Imagine I want to draw a Kirby diagram for T star is one with monodromy, a dent twist. A way of thinking about this is saying, well, let me draw T star is one with monodromy the identity. That's S1 times S2. So th that's just one, one handle attachment. And then you add a critical handle. So every time you want to add some critical handle, you need to know which Legendrian is. But now every Legendre is going to express a sum then twist in Lagrangians in the page. And that, that's, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain. I'm trying to explain that if you have some Lagrangians in the page. Sorry? I mean, this is S and this is L. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's the page W. And now I imagine that you want to describe the contact manifold which has monodromy tau s, tau l, tau s squared, something like that. Then you would just attach, well, s once, l once, and s twice, right? But you should be able to attach them just like this in the front. But now if I give you some random Legendrian, like without thinking I want to attach it, just the Legendrian itself, then I need to know how to lift tau s of l. Like tau s of l is an exact Lagrangian, and I want to understand how to draw it in this front. Is, is this clear? Okay. Uh, okay. So the the goal is that if we n if you have a drawing of a front such so that you understand s and you understand l, then you want to lift tau s of l or tau s minus one of l or some other word. So let's start by the easy one. So um, tau s and tau s minus one. So on the left-hand side, I've drawn the Lagrangian projection. So that's a positive dent twist of s along l. L here is the axis given by y equals zero or p equals zero. And then s is the axis given by q equals p. So that's, that's what that represents. So the left-hand side is a Lagrangian projection. And then you do the dent twist. And the claim is that this right-hand side is precisely the Legendrian lift. 
OK? Great. So that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, you just do the negative den twist, and you just leave that. You should think of this as a very simple local computation, where you have parameterized those Lagrangian handles. Think of it as Polterovich circuit if you want. And then you have Qs and Ps, and you want to go to Qs and Zs. So what you do is you take the P, you, you differentiate the Q, you multiply, and you integrate. And that's going to give you the Z. And because there's rotational symmetry all the way, you just spin around on the, on the front. OK? Now, uh, I should talk deeply about that cone point on the left-hand side. So up, when you have tau S of L, there's a cone point. Uh, I will defer that for later, if I have time. But that cone point is a non-stable gender and singularity. So it's not a generic front. But let's just keep it as it is. And maybe I'll talk about it later. Yes. Yes. But it's not my fault. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's somebody else's. No, yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah, I indeed, indeed. Yeah, that's true. Great. Um, so a corollary of, of this theory, and I wanted to mention it f for you to notice why this might be important as well in contact topology, is that you can actually interpret now Legendrian handle slides in terms of that. So something that happens in the symplectic world, which is quite astonishing because it doesn't happen in the smooth world, is that handle slides are dent twists. So there's no notion of dent twist in the smooth world. Like, it's not canonical in any sense. Whereas in the symplectic world, it is, because it's what happens to a generic well, left shift singularity. And in, in actually, what you get is that you can deduce that the handle slides in the legendary world are just doing dent twists of someone al along someone else. Uh, if you want to think of, about it, the proof goes like that. You take the cobordism that gives you the critical handle attachment, and that's one contact manifold, that's another contact manifold. So what you want to understand is what happens when you take some Legendrian path in here, what happens downstairs. But if you think of the Weinstein cobordism in the critical case as being z squared, so a left shift singularity, one of them is the imaginary part, and the open book is given, like the Morse function is the real part, and the open book is given by the imaginary part. But that, that exactly tells you that when you go down and then up again, that's a dent twist, because that's a monotony along z squared. So th that's something that happens in the symplectic world, which is not true in general. So uh, here's how you handle the slide in general. You have some Legendrian lambda, and then some other Legendrian sigma, and you want to handle slide sigma along lambda, and the resulting handle slide Legendrian is exactly this h sub lambda of sigma, OK? So uh, what am I saying in here? Well, I'm saying the following thing, is that if you have some contact manifold, which is expressed as some surgery, and you have some knot floating around, you can obtain a bunch of knots isotopic to it by handle sliding along it. So I, I, I choose your favorite. The gender in here, so you have this trefoil, and imagine you have some manifold which looks like that. That's some contact manifold in Kirby form. You can spin it around, it doesn't matter which dimension. And then you wonder, you know, what's this knot in here? Like, is this knot loose? Maybe it is, maybe it's not loose. For instance, this, this loose, by the way, means that you can isotope it to something that has this, this chart in here. So if a knot in the front has this, that's, that's called a loose knot. So Maybe you, you care about this not being loose. We'll see it right now why. And what you, you can do is you can just legendrian isotopic around. So for instance, if you know that this is a minus 1 curve, you could just do something like that. Like, well, this is the same thing as doing this, this uh, thing in here. OK, so this in here. And maybe this not now it's obviously loose to you or not loose to you. OK? The point is that you have commutatorial moves that allows you to go from one knot to an isotopic one, and maybe in this new form, you can see better some properties of the knot. For instance, if it bounds a Lagrangian, if it has a filling, so on and so forth. So, OK, because it's disrespectful not to have a theorem being proven in a talk. Let me prove a theorem. Uh, so here's a theorem. Um, so contact manifolds, which are obtained by taking as a page t star as n, and as monotony, a negative then twist of an arbitrary power are over twisted. So first, what does it mean to be overtwisted in high dimensions? Well, it means to have an overtwisted disk as John described, okay, some ball, a B3 ball with a contact structure that John called overtwisted, times Cn. 
So if you find some contacts on manifold of this form, the contact manifold is over twisted. Now, uh, we proved that this was the same thing as having the knot being loose. So the best thing about this is that you can completely forget about overtwistedness and care only about looseness of Legendrians. So now, you want to prove that some manifold is overtwisted. Well, you draw the knot somewhere around. This is the red knot up in the top. That's an knot. And now you have a surgery diagram for your manifold. And now what you do is you try to create a loose chart for that knot. And for instance, what I claim is that you can start isotoping the upper Legendrian, this flying saucer, and make it this down one. OK? So uh, how do you do that? Well, imagine you have this thing here. You start here. And the first thing you do is you handle slide. Well, these are plus one curves. By the previous one, you can just say that this is the same thing as this. OK, so the knot is now the red guy in the searcher manifold. Now you can take this out, because this is a randomizer move in any dimension. And you can actually put these guys away if you want. So this is also the knot. And now you can try to handle slide again. Say, for instance, with respect to either this guy or this guy again. It, it doesn't matter. So uh, say you handle slide along with this guy. OK. And now you're able to take this part in here and, sorry? Uh, this is zero plus ones. Yeah. And so um, in here you see something that you can pull up because it's a cone. So you take this guy and you pull it up all the way and you get that guy. So that's, that's how you get from one to the other. Now, if there are more guys, you end up having something which has a piece that looks like this. And then, well, sorry, color coding. So you end up having a piece that looks like this, and then a bunch of guys. Now, the red thing is loose. It has a loose chart. But it's not loose in the complement of the things you're surgering on. So that doesn't imply that the red thing is loose. Because you know, there's a loose chart, and then you're surging it, destroying it. So the point is, can you do something and prove that this piece by itself is loose even after surgery? And the answer is yes. And uh, I, I won't bore you with the details. But essentially, you start handle sliding like that. And then you handle slide again in here. And you handle slide again in here. OK? And then you start moving this part up. And if you do that, you're going to prove that the guy on the left-hand side is isotopic to the guy on the right-hand side, OK? Where the dots means that they are cones. So that proves that the red guy is loose. But the red guy was initially the knot. So in this manifold, the knot is loose. OK. Maybe three comments on this theorem. Uh, first, it's completely obvious in dimension three, uh, because right varying criterion, homotopy classes, whatever you want. Uh, it's, 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 it was known to be true in dimension three. And something particularly nice of this is that k equals two, it's the case of a fiber dent twist. So uh, in, in the case of T star S n, if you do a fiber dent twist, that's symplectically isotopic to the square of a dent twist. And it was computed by uh, Otto and co-authors that those have zero, well, symplectic contact homology, zero cellulomorphic invariance. And uh, yeah, it was not known whether they were over twisted. And now it's known. And it provides for many constructions. For instance, uh, here's a funny thing. Take D4. That's a ball. Now, just consider the open book, which is this D4 times the identity, so monotony identity. This, as John explained, it's known as standard S5. Great. Now, take a cylinder inside this D4, OK? Such that, well, a T star is one inside of it. If you want to think of it, think just a smooth, affine conic inside C2. OK. And now put it in a way such that, well, it's first a symplectic submanifold, a Weinstein submanifold, but plus that when you do a fiber dent twist on the boundary, it induces a fiber dent twist on that guy. Great. Now you know that the fiber dent twist on D4, the boundary dent twist, it's isotopic to the identity. So you're not doing anything. But on the inside, you're going to get a negative dent twist, if you wish, if you take the negative one, in this T star Sn. In this case, I'm saying T star S1. 
But now the open book that you're obtaining for that guy is an overtwisted submanifold. So that's proving how to obtain overtwisted spheres in codimension two inside the standard sphere. Okay, so that's related, I think, to what John will talk tomorrow a bit. I mean, it just provides a bit of insight of what kind of embeddings can we find, and it also relates to your question of how to do things with open books. So that that explains how to say embed an overtwisted S five inside a standard S seven in a very explicit way. Great. So uh, let's go for another corollary. So here, imagine you have a loose loop gender in a contact manifold, and then you perform plus one surgery. Well, maybe the contact manifold you obtain is overtwisted. Now the proof is completely immediate. Here it is. Well, the only thing you have to prove is that in the new manifold, the knot is loose. So again, you just loose gender and handle slide. So I've given two proofs in here. The first one is, well, take the knot, handle slide it, and then try to get the zigzag. So in here, this zigzag pulls off. So you get that that's a zigzag, and in here is another way using loose charts, okay? So that, that explains how uh, to get over twistedness of a manifold in terms of loose Legendrians, so in this case of Legendrians. So that's part of what I meant when we wrote the title Conduct Topology from the Legendrian Viewpoint. Like it's very interesting to talk about over twistedness and over twistedness of manifolds, but right now the best knowledge we have about those is actually by studying Legendrians and how to do operations in them. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the blackboard and explain uh, something else, which is how to write an arbitrary word. And in the second talk, so after the break, we're going to kind of start fresh, and I'm going to talk about the theory of bi Lefschetz vibrations and apply it to Stein and Weinstein manifolds and actually go to the theorem that I stated before. So I didn't realize this was a hawk because I didn't know hawks were a thing here, but what I know is that it's a loose hawk. So, uh, yeah. In the second part of the talk, uh, I'll also introduce uh, loose docs. To draw tau S of L, so a dent twist, and a negative dent twist. So now I'm going to explain how to draw an arbitrary word. There are three ways I know how to do that. This is probably the fastest, but uh, it takes a bit of a while to explain why it happens. So let's at least black box and, and see how to do it. So how to draw, well, it's up to you. So, great. So, um, imagine you have some Legendrians, and suppose we call them L and S Legendrians, and we're going to draw them here. So, this is the Legendrian L, and this is the Legendrian S. Great. If I ask you where, where is S, well, S is this guy. Where is L? Well, L is this guy. Whatever, anything you draw will be okay as long as it passes once through the handle because of looseness. Great. If I now ask you who is tau S of L, well, tau S of L is this guy. If you remember what I drawn before, that's everything spun around. So if I ask you what's tau S minus one of L, it's this guy. And there's a cone in here. The only thing you should keep in mind for a cone is that the following operation is not true. So if you're a 3D person, you're going to pull this cusp. But if, if, you, if there's a big dot, you're not pulling this cusp, OK? So that's probably the main thing about a cone. Can you guys see the red? Barely? Sort of. OK. Well, I'm going to erase it. So. Now, you know how to do tau s of l. You know how to do tau l of s, uh, tau, yeah, tau l of s, which is tau s minus 1 of l. And now the question becomes, well, what if I give you something like Tau square. So how do you draw that? Well, a way of thinking about this is, well, I have to handle slide twice about S. And that, that will be okay. That's one way of doing it. But I'm going to explain another one, which is you think of this as being the monodromy of something. So this is an exact Lagrangian. So you can think of it as doing a dent twist along it. If you do a dent twist along this guy, it's going to become tau S, tau S, then tau L, and then the inverse of that, okay? It's this word, it induces this word. If I attach something along it, it would induce this word in the monodromy. So that's telling me draw minus one S, minus one S, well, plus one S, plus one S, 
So my plus one surgeries, which are the negative one, and, and then draw L, S, S as minus one curves. Great, so let's do that. You first start with S minus one, so that's one, and that has a plus one framing. And then you do S minus one again. Oh, I should be going up. So the red ones are plus one. So you first draw that guy, that's the first S, then it's the second S. The reason you go up is because the red flow goes up, so that's, that's how you're attaching. And now we have L. So L is attached in here. This is the height, because recall that the rep core was in the middle. So we only care about the height in the rep core. And then, so this is a minus one, and then we attach this twice. Which one? Can I change the rep? It's not up. Is this better? Okay. Uh, Great. And now, what's this resulting Legendrian? Well, now comes the game of put everything which is up down. Because what happens if I have two Legendrians which are parallel to each other? Imagine I have something like that. And this is a plus one surgery and this is a minus one surgery. Then they cancel each other. This is just a pair of canceling critical points. So if I'm able to move all this guy down, Right? Then I'll, I'll just cancel the rest. Do you agree with that? So let's start doing this. So uh, for that, let me do this here. So we start with this handle. And the first thing we do is we perform something that destroys these things. So uh, these are better. Okay. Black one somewhere. Okay. Um, great. So recall that what we had was as in inverse twice. Now, this is much better. And then this thing. So these are plus ones. This is a minus one, and this is a minus one. So the first thing you do is you move these guys to one down. So this pulling in here goes down by a Legendre handle slide. So you Legendre handle slide with a plus one surgery along that guy. And the thing you obtain is exactly the following picture. It is the, now the, the black becomes that guy in here. Now this guy now lives up and the other still lives down. And then the two up stay exactly the same. Okay, I'm just doing a handle slide. Now these two curves run parallel and they're the same. So it's the same thing as canceling this thing. Yeah. I'm actually inverting it. I mean, yeah, if, if you go that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that locally, you know, if this is a plus one and doing it it's this thing. I'm saying these two pictures are the same. Okay, maybe we can discuss it later. Thanks. Um, okay, uh, so you get there, and now you're gonna move either the green up or the red down. So something you can do is you can start moving the red down like this. This is an allowed move, okay, the, the red in here. And now you can push this intersection point in here up to the other side. Okay, and now you have this minus one curve. So when you pull from it, what you get is, well, the inverse. So you're gonna get a cone. So the resulting manifold looks like that. It looks like a cusp in here. And then in here, we're coning with this guy. And now the red one leaves downstairs, okay? But now the two guys coincide, so you just cancel them. And the upshot of that is that if somebody asks you who is tau s squared of L, is exactly this manifold. But be aware that this is a cone. So it pulls in dimension three, but it doesn't pull in dimension more than three, okay? So this is how you get to powers of then twist in that. So what happens if I have something more sophisticated? So what happens if I have 
L, S, and maybe some other guys like T, more Lagrangians. I'm just going to have more handles. But what I do is any word I have, I just write it like this, write all of them, and then just process this thing down such that everything cancels. The beauty of that is that you do know it cancels. So if you work enough, you, you get how. And then you get this unique Lagrangian, which is what has to happen. OK, so, uh, so that's. That's, that's the basic stuff you need to know about the front. So how to, given two Lagrangians or three Lagrangians or as many as you want, you draw them as these guys. Those are the zero sections. And then any word in an end twist between them is just going to be pictures like that. OK? Things you can do with that. Well, prove that something is over twisted, as we have done before. Just start taking the knot and just try to create a loose chart. It's pretty fun to do that. Uh, other things you can do, well, create better surgery diagrams, so on and so forth. So in the second part of the talk, I will talk about Lesch's vibrations, where it becomes extremely important to know whether certain things are loose or not. Okay? But uh, for now, I'm just going to erase. Sorry? This diagram? So this is the... I imagine you want to draw this Legendrian. In the contact manifold, say T star S plumbed with T star L times C boundary. That's a Legendrian knot in a five, well, in, in some odd dimensional contact manifold. Okay? Now, what is it? Now, a priori, you, you could just say, you know, it's, it's anything because it, it only passes once through L, so again, it's loose. So if the monodromy is the identity, everything is loose. So a priori, you could say anything. But you want to know how it sits relative to S and L. So what you do is you, you draw L, which you think of it as the zero section. You draw S, and then you try to do the dent twist. And what I'm saying now is that if you have some other word, which is not as easy as tau S or tau S minus 1, what you do is you take this. You think of it as being something along which you attach a minus 1. That creates this monodromy. This monodromy in the open book clearly cancels, because this cancels with this, and this cancels with this. So at the end, it's just the same thing as attaching tau of L. But in the relative position of them, it, it doesn't cancel. So that's going to tell you exactly how the Lagrangian in here sits with respect to S and L. Yeah, yeah. As, as a monodromy, yeah. Between these and these? Yeah. This is tau of this. I mean... That's exactly what you're saying. But you can even claim that that's the Legendrian, not only the dead twist. Uh, I mean, OK, if, if, I, if the Legendrian sits on its own, it doesn't matter because it's loose. But if the Legendrian, if I wanted to draw the Legendrian link this, like, who is it? And then, well, this link in particular is going to be you first draw L, it has to be an ordered link, so something like L, and then you're going to draw that guy. So, um, well, draw it here, whatever it is. Doesn't matter. So that's the link. So, uh, I mean, again, typically what, what happens is that you have some contact manifold, it has some open book, and it has some monodromy. This is always, in dimension three, it's always this case. Uh, and, and then you, you wonder, what's the front of that Legendrian? Is that Legendrian loose? And one, or not loose? Or what happens if I do a minus one surgery or plus one surgery? Do I get an over manifold? I don't. What's the covertism? So on and so forth. So this is a recipe to draw those guys. Another way of doing it would be handle slide ones along S, which is what has happened here, and then pin down exactly where the rep cord is and handle slide again. It's, it's essentially what's happening, but this is more kind of combinatorial way of doing things. 